My name is Mark Dreyfors. I represent a bunch of different organizations. I'm a graduate of the Nicholas School at Duke. Um, I did my undergraduate at UNC Wilmington in environmental studies. Um, I actually concentrated in chemistry and was kind of interested in the oil and gas industry. Did a lot of work and did some publications in industrial hygiene and toxicology and was particularly interested in the oil and gas industry, how it works, how you know, powerful it is. You, you, know, you look at today and the world around us and we're very much shaped by the energy that we consume, um, the petroleum products. Ended up coming to Duke and did my master's on natural gas and that's pretty controversial at this point. You all know about fracking. My uh, master's thesis was on the Outer Continental Shelf of North Carolina looking at if they went and actually discovered oil or gas off the coast, what some of the onshore implications would be, where they would route pipelines, where they would put treatment and processing facilities, where they actually send the gas um, given certain pricing. And um, was using and, and went to visit places like Louisiana, Alabama, California to look at what their infrastructure and how they regulated the oil and gas industry there, and created a document that would help local communities, cities, um, and the state regulate the oil and gas industry. What I found was that the oil and gas industry is hard to regulate. I don't know if you noticed that little bit of a stain in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, not too many people have gone to jail over that. I think they just had their first uh, prosecution, um, and it, it's it really calls to question, you know, our whole, the way in which our society is developed. Um, we have created an economy, a social economy, a political economy that is built on very, very cheap energy. We have been blessed and cursed with cheap energy. Fossil fuels have been one of many of a, what we call a carbon epic. Um, and this was quite, Amazing! I kind of had that epiphany moment, you know. And the thing is, it's so amazing. People, you know, ask me to come and speak or whatever, and I don't consider myself an expert. I've been doing this stuff a while, but I'm always learning. And I was over at Duke for a lecture on food, people, and land, something like that. And a very famous um, researcher um, from the Land Institute put in perspective this period that we're in of fossil fuel dependency, this, require, this reliance on fossil fuels. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about these, uh, this idea of carbon, carbon on the planet. I also wanted to talk a little bit about you know, energy balances and energy budgets, because we really have to get better in tune with understanding what the energy we currently use, and particularly the petroleum industry, what its energy components are and what its benefits are, and then what some of these alternatives are, in particularly liquid fuels, biofuels, and what the planet itself has the capacity to give to us. We've been living for, and now over 100 years, on a fossil fuel shunt, an enormous amount of energy, very, very cheap to get at and to, to consume and to use. And it has changed our society enormously. So we have to get back, we have to get back to a perception of the world and understanding of how these systems, these larger systems work and this balance that has to take place because we are way out of balance at this point. And it really has to do with this, this idea of carbon. So going back to the planet, let's simply draw a very poor picture of the Earth in red, it should be blue. Um, where do we get our energy? Sun, exactly. Sun, we'll put it really little in the distance, but of course it dwarfs the Earth. Sun comes in, hits the planet, got this atmosphere that kind of runs around. We know about the greenhouse effect. The sun comes in in certain wavelengths and then bounces back, hits the, either goes out into space or hits this atmosphere and bounces back and keeps radiating. And that is the Goldilocks effect. You know, our planet is at just the right distance from the sun and based on the composition of our atmosphere, we 
really rely on this really wonderful little layer, and it's very, very thin. If this was the proportion of the, the Earth, then that layer, they call it the thin blue line, and the, the astronauts who've actually seen from space this thin blue line, it, it's, it is so fragile and it's so small, a couple miles thick, um, and it contains this enormous collection of chemicals, um, gases, and each one reacts to the sun and how the energy from the sun comes through it. But it's this Goldilocks effect, this idea that the sun's energy comes in, hits the planet, some, the planet absorbs a certain amount of that energy, it re-radiates re out. So what's one of the things that is really important to this energy balance that comes in from the sun? What this, particularly the reflection, the movement of the uh, energy away from the planet. So any ideas? It's on the North Pole and the South Pole. Ice, exactly. Albedo effect, the idea of the, um, this, all this light energy coming in and bouncing off the ice and rolling back out. Well, we know what's happening. The ice is shrinking, partly due to the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, methane. Um, and we also get quite a bit of reflection from moisture from the clouds. So this little combination, this, this kind of melting pot, this stew of gases, of relationships of land to sea to water, all makes, in the, in the distance between, to the sun, all make our planet this kind of beautiful place to live. It is unbelievably rare. From what we can tell, Earth-like ecosystems, Earth-like planets in, in the universe are probably pretty hard to find. There are some out there. Ones with life, hmm, possible. Um, probably, probably exist. There's so much possibility. But we know that this system is very unique. It is the Goldilocks effect. So the sun's energy comes in, and for however long, billion years or so, it kind of just didn't do anything. When the sun's energy came in and the earth was this huge stew, what's the other source of energy that we have from the planet? Other sources? Stop. The core of the planet? Yeah, the inside. So we've got you know, this energy, molten material, and that provides geothermal energy. And that's, I think, I don't know if you've had a lecture on that, but that's one of the other sources. Yeah, um, pretty fascinating. I mean, it's this, you know, as thin as the atmosphere is, the mantle is also extremely thin, and so there's underneath not too far away is an enormous abundance of energy available to us. But for the most part, you know, our society has been living on the energy that has accumulated from the sun and its penetration to the surface of the planet and the evolution of these life forms and plants being the primary producers are that mechanism by which we capture naturally the energy of the sun. Amazing, amazing process. We have yet to really even be able to mimic it in technology. Um, we have solar cells, which you all learned about. And uh, the technology is improving. They're getting cheaper. They're getting more efficient. But the efficiency by which plants are able to capture that sun's energy and convert it into carbon and other, other materials is, is absolutely an amazing thing. It's like, holy cow, how did that happen? How did that evolve? For about a billion years, we, the, the planet didn't have much going on. And then eventually, the unicellular organism started evolving. And the ability for some of these um, unicellular organisms, these algaes, um, developed and were able to capture that energy from the sun. And then over time, you know, the planet went through these enormous oscillations. And I mean, you look at CO2 levels, and that's not too good, CO2 versus temperature, there's a strong correlation there. So over the period of the Earth's history, you had these enormous oscillations in temperature, 
And what we found is that life started stabilizing these oscillations, life forms. In combination with you know, the, the continental drift and things like that, there's this kind of this bunch of complex things coming together. But really, it was life, plants, and other life forms that eventually helped take some of this uh, carbon out of the atmosphere, started to change the uh, composition of the atmosphere. And so during one of these great periods of what we would call flourishings, and there's been numbers of them on the planet, the plant communities just took off. I mean, just went crazy. Giant trees, enormous amounts of uh, vegetation, sequestering carbon, pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. Carbon that had been there pretty much from the primeval, primeval times. Um, you know, the balance of these chemicals, gases, uh, the basic materials within the plant, our planet, are reflected in the universe. Uh, universally, these, there's kind of this balance of these materials. And when we started, we had this balance of you know, these different types of things. Some were a little bit higher and some were a little bit lower. And then over time, they shifted a little bit. And those shifts really had a lot to do with how these flourishings um, uh, occurred and uh, how successful they were. So about 200 million years ago or so, we had one of these great flourishings. And the amount of plant mass, biomass, increased enormously. And eventually, that stuff died um, and was sedimentized, put underneath sediments, and became the fossil fuels to, of which today we are using. And we're using a pretty enormous range of fossil fuels, but many of them are coming from about that 200, 200 million year period. You've got the methanes, you've got the coals, you have the different types of coals, and you have the um, petroleum. And all are based on how much compression that was, you know, how, much, how many layers of materials were laid over the top, the types of materials that were laid over the top, and how much heat was applied from underneath um, and from just the whole compaction process. So you've got like the coal, bituminous, lignus, lignite, and anthracite, um, you know, the even carbon in the form of diamonds have been sequestered. Lots of pressure and time make those fossil fuels. And so those things settled. The process of you know, the dying of plants, the um, stream wash, the movement of them into basins. And these basins got covered over, and they often are, the fossil fuels are found in these kind of oscillations of the, the the geologic structure, natural gas being on top, the gas wants to release, the oil being on top of that, and then you know, uh, less quality oils being underneath. So they stick a straw down into that little dome um, and collect the liquid fuels. In the case of like coal, you've got these giant seams up in West Virginia and even here in North Carolina. And they will remove the overburden, the top material, and go at it. Or in the old days, they used to mine into the, the sides of mountains and pull the stuff out. So for years, you know, coal was discovered back in 1700s, somewhere around there, and petroleum, late 1800s. Um, and those periods were influential in the development of human society. So going back to this idea of epics, carbon epics, this is the epiphany that I had when I was at, over at Duke. There are essentially four major carbon epics, and this is central to our uh, history as a human on this planet. So what are those carbon periods? Any, any suggestions? We've talked about you know, coal is one, oil being another. Any other ideas about what the major coal? The, the epics really had a lot to do with population. Population and the harnessing carbon. So we consume 
carbon. We eat carbon plants all the time. Um, so what are some of the, what would you think was the first carbon epoch? Anybody? Was it wood? That's the second. Very close. The first one was what we make bread from? Grains. Grains. Bingo. Awesome. The harnessing of the domestication, I guess, of grains in the Middle East, mostly the Eurasian kind of um, this interface between the kind of Asian mountain range, the, the Asian area, and this steep, I guess, steps of the Eurasian mountain range. The domestication of these grains, and almost all of our grains come from that, that region, that area, was really the first carbon ep epic. They collected wild grasses and were able to uh, domesticate them, plant them in rows, irrigate them, and increase through genetics the ability of that carbon to feed us. And with that, oops, it's pretty cool. I'll <laughs> get everybody's attention. The, I should go right here actually, probably the sound of my stomach here, it's about that time. Um, so with that carbon and the harnessing of the grains, the population went up pretty strongly. The Middle East soared through the just absolutely population took off. Where did they take off? What, what's the, the areas that it really took off first? Where they, they, they domesticated the grains, but what did they need to be able to grow the grains in abundance? Yeah. Exactly, river basins. The Egyptian area, Nile, Tigris Euphrates, Indus River. That, those areas just took off. Population went through the ceiling. And what happens when that happens is that, okay, there's a lot of people. People want stuff. People need houses. So what's the second carbon echo? Wood. So houses, they need wood to build ships, build these giant whatever it is. Um, and so the second carbon effort was the taking off and harvesting of wood. You know, there's, in the Bible, there's this idea of the cedars of Lebanon, very famous passage, and you see it several times. And it portrays an image of abundance. Um, and there's lots of abundance metaphors within the Bible and within a lot of the Middle Eastern um, early religions. So much of that region was heavily abundant. In fact, most of it, and you see it today, you wouldn't realize was heavily forested. They had lions, they had all sorts of animal species that were throughout the Middle East. And due to this rapid deforestation, for boats and for housing and for their, their needs, the different civilizations, those ecosystems changed very, very, very quickly. In the period of maybe several hundred years, what was a very abundant um, forest ecosystem became more desert-like because they cut the trees and whacked the trees. A lot of the lower areas, river basins, were being used for agriculture and intensive agriculture. So, with this idea of um, ecosystem change, um, it was quite interesting. There's even early mention within some of the early documents, for early, some of the first written documents, that there are needs to manage better these resources. So during the second period of the carbon epoch, this tree period, you're starting to see some real pressures being placed on natural resources and actually people being perceptive of it. Even in Greece, um, there are laws pertaining to how you manage trees and take care of them. And there's even some evidence that the cutting of trees in the Mediterranean area, this, some of these civilizations, were actually the, the downfall and the fall of them was due to the cutting of trees. And what, what's the reason? What would be, obviously, you know, there's it gets dry, but what's one of the real things that trees do that are super helpful for us? Oxygen. They, they release oxygen. That's really helpful. In fact, yeah, if you go back to those earlier periods, it was the plants that really changed you know, our, our um, 
gas ratios dramatically and allowed for an oxygen-rich environment, which allowed us all this energy and which required us to need all those grains. Um, but one thing that, that trees do, they've got awesome roots and it keeps soil in place. So, and as well, there are almost like a straw for moisture. So it brings moisture from deep down, helps slow runoff from rain. So trees provide an enormous um, value to humans and what they call ecosystem services. So during the second epoch of this harvesting of trees for uses, one of the, what's one of the other uses of trees that um, was during this period, what they call the Calcolithic period. It's when they were all, everybody was into fighting each other. They were, you know, populations were increasing. So what did they need to be able to fight each other? Weapons. So what were they making the weapons from? Wood, uh, that was pretty, a little earlier, you know. Those guys got their butts kicked. <laughs> the ones that were using the wood, the ones that were making stuff from iron, the Iron Age and the Calcolithic, copper, bronze periods, where they started using enormous amounts of wood to, what, smelt the ores, exactly. So you just see all this pressure being placed on this somewhat limited, it's a renewable resource, but with populations going through the ceiling, a little bit challenging. So that's the second epoch, very interesting, and we'll come back to that. So third epoch, what's the third period that we, what happened with the third carbon epoch? Coal. coal, bingo. Discovery of coal, huge impact. Um, incredibly important. Okay, great, thanks. Oh wow, more colors. Woohoo! Um, I'll have to think how to use them now. Uh, <laughs> makes me have to really work now. Um, so I have to think three dimensionally. Almost two-dimensionally, but with three colors. Uh, so you know, coal became the engine of industrial evolution for economic development. Um, coal had been around for a while; people had used it, they'd thrown it on their fires. Um, but it was the discovery in Western Europe, primarily in Britain, where they found these very enormous seams of coal, and they, you know, great images of the miners and. You know, people getting, living their life trying to uh, extract coal. And it became this uh, an amazing uh, tool, the energy captured in it was used to power steam engines. Um, and steam engines were able to uh, move water. You know, before it had been more mechanical power or wind energy. You know, they used winds for, um, and, uh, lots of places wind to, to move water from one place to the other. Once you had a steam engine, you could pretty much move water anywhere you wanted to. And then, you know, transportation with railroads, um, enormous impact. And all of this, what's quite amazing is that as the carbon, as we learn to harness carbon, population as well just went up like crazy. So if you look at the population chart, you know, you population doubled, tripled, quadrupled in a very short period of time. You know, you're looking at this third carbon epoch, something like the 1700s on. And then we have the fourth one, which is petroleum, petroleum exactly. And somewhat natural gas. Right now, we're finding natural gas to be very convenient as, a, as an energy source. Um, it's very cheap right now um, due to new technology, this fracking technology where they do horizontal drilling. Amazing how they do it, I don't know. The computer controlled, so cool. But it has a, an edge to it. They have to, to push down into these layers of shale and of these layers of fossil fuels, um, these fossil materials these fossilized materials, these liquids, these drilling fluids, and in them are, are an array of chemicals that we don't know about, and they don't, don't want to publish, they don't want to release this information. And we know that you stuff something down under high pressure underground, everything likes to find its way out of that high pressure, and there's evidence that both the gas and these, these drilling fluids are seeking their 
equilibrium point, reducing pressure and coming to the surface and contaminating groundwater and pretty amazing uh, process. And it's not everywhere, but a lot has to do with the quality and how they do their drilling. It has a lot to do with the types of layers and sediments that they're drilling into. So this area happens to be one of the hot spots for potential future natural gas. Natural gas is pretty cool. It's, it's amazing as a uh, resource. It is also a precursor to many, many of the uh, basic chemicals in petrochemical industry. Um, it is also, what's, one, what's the main thing that natural gas is used for to make? It's something that we need for growing things. Fertilizer, exactly. Natural gas is the cheapest foreign form of energy. So to make fertilizer and to make fertilizer cheap, they use enormous amounts of natural gas in making fertilizers. And of course, what does that do? Helps produce more food cheaply, which is kind of one of the issues of costs. You know, what is the cost of our food? So we talk about the balance of the planet the energy balance, sun coming in, the planet is in this kind of equilibrium, but because we're burning so much fossil fuel, we're sending all this gas that was sequestered in these little fossil fuel holes under the ground, it took hundreds of millions of years to take the carbon out of the atmosphere and put it under the ground and create this nice little happy, oh, this is, this is good, this happy little blue planet that allowed us as humans to really flourish. And this period of flourishing for us is literally this period right here. We, in 10,000 years, what you see over the climate chart, the famous graph, oscillations. Squiggles, oscillations, squiggles, oscillations, and carbon going up, the famous hockey stick. But these oscillations have been enormous over time. But in the last 10,000 years or so, this is the Holocene, those oscillations have reduced substantially. And it's primarily due to this carbon changing. In the mouth, a lot less of it, and also the oscillations that occur from planet shifting, sun's radiation. But what we're doing is throwing the system oscillation way out of balance. We're taking enormous tons, megatons of carbon and throwing it up into the atmosphere. And what that does, you know, is create the greenhouse effect. And that is changing the planet, and it's going to change it enormously. And what we're going to get back to is this period of incredible oscillations. So balance is really the game. You know, we are in this period right now, and have been for the last 10,000 years, of a, a really nice, happy medium of planetary balance between the amount of energy coming from the sun, the composition of the atmosphere, the amount of reflectivity um, going back. And we're getting ready to really throw a huge wrench in that. So our budget, our energy budget from the planet, our budget for food, our budget for energy that we consume is the big issue right now. So when we budget, you know, we got our checkbook at, you know, we get a certain amount of money coming in from mom or from the job that we've got, and then we spend it. We spend it on food fun, entertainment, whatever. Probably gasoline for cars. If anybody drive, does anybody drive? Yeah, gasoline for cars, man. That hits the pocket pretty big. And for particularly low-income people, they use a higher percentage of their income on energy. Energy bills have, tend to have less efficient houses. So they're making money, and they're forking over a lot for energy, a huge amount. That's something we kind of are very sensitive about. Our operation, our site, the goal site is over in East Durham. We're really interested in this equity, social equity issue of how to help other folks out. And 
particularly with the, the knowledge of how these things are fitting together and what we can do to improve our own personal balance of energy consumption um, and our lifestyle. The energy that we are consuming today is a legacy of millions of years. The fuel that we put in a car, that's something that's a common heritage to all of us. And who says that we, as Americans, get to consume all of that legacy when there's so many people around the world that don't have access to those types of resources? It's really a fairness issue. So when we go forward and try to develop public policy, when we try to figure out how to get better in tune with this natural system that's been a blessing to us, we've got to really look at the social equity issue and this idea of balance, this fairness thing. So a little bit about um, what we do. Um, you know, since I graduated from Duke, I, you know, I, I did my master's on, this, on the natural gas thing, and it was pretty eye-opening. I was kind of surprised at how brutal the oil and gas industry was and how tough it was. And, took my resume around after graduate school and tried to get a job. And they didn't really want somebody with a master's in environmental management. They wanted geologists and petroleum engineers and you know, somebody who looked at the big picture and tried to make them nicer and greener or happier. They were not so interested. So it was not, I think today they may be more interested in that, that type of thing. It's a pretty interesting one. The trustees on the board of the Nicholas School is actually one of the chief scientists for ExxonMobil. And you know, they're kind of the evil incarnate they just wrote a book. There's a new book out on ExxonMobil. Um, and it is uh, you know, kind of fascism or corporate control at its greatest. They have, have enormous amounts of power globally. They have enormous amounts of power within our own political structure. And they have power over us as consumers. We don't have a lot of choices in what and how we move ourselves around and how we keep ourselves warm in the wintertime. It's essentially a mo monopoly. What we have been doing over in Durham is trying to test models for alternatives. And this idea of using waste, like waste vegetable oil from our fryers, and turning it into fuel, oh, that sounds like a really cool idea. And we were pretty enamored with it when we first came across it, the idea of cutting our independence from the big oil companies and the fossil fuel industries. That's a, a pretty empowering thing for, for us as you know, we've been kind of connected, very heavily collect, connected to this fossil fuel thing. And it, it's, it truly is, you know, the, our presidents and uh, everybody talks about it like an addiction. And it affects us as humans like an addiction because we are using an energy source that for its amount of work, you know, you put what they call a BTU. Anybody know what that is? Exactly. You're good. She's nailing it out of the park here. Bitter's thermal unit. It's a measure of energy. And it's quite interesting. If you look at the amount of work that goes into drilling into the ground and what you get out of it that comes back out to get that oil, I mean, you know, they, they talk that, you know, ExxonMobil cries that we need subsidies from the government to help pay for this cost of going and exploring for oil and getting it and bringing it back to us. But the truly, if you look at the cost associated, you know, that drilling platform that they were drilling in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico is expensive, there's no doubt. And that's really what they call extreme oil, very hard to get at, very deep in deep water, um, very dangerous, very deep under the sediments of the Gulf. That stuff is expensive. It's billions of dollars that they, it takes. But you look at the amount of money that comes out of that reserve, that bunch of oil, is enormous. It gets paid back. That billion dollar investment up front gets paid back way, like many hundreds of times over the course of that, that oil wells um, period. So when you look at things like biofuel, you think of the amount of energy that goes in. We obviously have the energy from the sun and it's being collected by plants. This idea of a carbon cycle where the plant sequesters, let's see, which one shall I use? I'm gonna go use blue. Got the sun's energy coming to the plant. 
and it produces fruits. And you as well can use the woody biomass and the leaf material, but the fruits are what most of our biofuels are made from. And you can make biofuel from animal fat as well, and animal fat is just another form of a long-term um, collected source of carbon. It's, um, the molecules are more long chain, and the, it's animals that have eaten plants and accumulated the fat into their bodies. But plants do the same thing, and they produce seeds that are the next generation of those plants. And in those seeds are a certain percentage of fat to allow that seed to be able to grow and flourish as it needs to before it you know, takes off and gets its, its leaves extended, their little solar panels out. Um, so most biofuel is based on what they call virgin oils, virgin seeds. Um, and what you do is you take that seed, like a soybean, and you crush it, and you extract the meal. The meal is actually a great food for animals. It has lots of nutritional value. And then the oil is squeezed out, and the oil can be used in all sorts of stuff. Soybean oil is one of these chemical bases that's used in all aspects of our food industry, and even in the chemical industry. We can make other chemicals from that material, and they tend to be more renewable, more sustainable. It can make... Um, Almost everything you see that's made from petroleum can be made from plant material, from these base materials. It just takes a little bit more chemistry and a little bit more time, and sometimes they don't tend to be as, as durable. Just depends on what it is. But you know, you can get um, styrofoam now. You know, the containers made from soy type material, and they are biodegradable. So this process of making fuel from this carbon cycle and being able to extract it. You know, the sun's energy comes in, you take this, and then you put it into some machine and burn it, and the carbon comes back out, and then the carbon is then sequestered back in to the plant. That's a carbon cycle that has been going on for as long as there have been plants on the, on the, um, on the planet. And, you know, Plants decay, they give off their gases, um, either through methane, the decomposers take that all that cycle and, and break it down. So that process has been going on for quite some time. So we're going to try to take what we've created as a civilization that's relying on this enormous fossil fuel shunt and shift it over back to this system, this natural system. It's a tall order, it's a tall task. Right now, we're using a lot of the mass of the planet, what you know, land mass there is, and most of the planet is, is water. What ag uh, arable lands are available, most of it is being used pretty heavily by what? Making growing food, and then people. People need a place to live. And what's amazing about this area, this area used to be a pretty intense agricultural area, and our soils are pretty depleted at this point. It grew a lot of tobacco, and if you go out there, you see the red clay. But before that, before we came, there was probably a good loam over the top of that red clay. And it, you know, consecutive generations of harvesting and cutting the trees down and depleting the soils, we go right back down to that red clay base. So we lose that loam. So to be able to shift our economy, and this is an enormous economy, trillions of dollars of economy, that's based on a very cheap energy source and shift it to something like this is an incredibly tall order. What's so cool about when I go to talk about biodiesel, people go, oh, biodiesel, you know, it's the solution for the future. Well, it's a solution, but it's one of many. And we're going to have to get a lot of solutions. And when I talk about biodiesel, I can't just talk about biodiesel as a fuel, a liquid fuel that substitutes for diesel. It is, in fact, a topic that unites me to agricultural policy. It, it um, talks to land use issues. It talks to energy policy. It talks to this whole idea of what we consume, our livelihoods, and how our economic system is structured. So in this little jar of biodiesel is a whole like encyclopedia of, of lectures. Um, it 
it is uniting of a lot of things. And that's what kind of makes it fun. One other thing that's really cool about biodiesel, one of the first researchers of biodiesel was a great African-American scientist. Anybody know? Bingo. Got it. Exactly. So he's one of the first guys to patent some of this research um, on biodiesel. And it's a very simple chemical process called transesterification. He was using soy as, I think, his um, material that he was working with um, and discovered all sorts of uses for it. Biodiesel can be used for enormous numbers of different things. Simply, the problem is that we do not have enough, enough land mass right now to make biodiesel even a small picture. And it comes back you know, to this idea of BTUs. When you make biodiesel from virgin stock, from virgin oils, you probably get about a one BTU in to three out. If you make it from, say, waste oil, you get a little bit higher than that, probably a one to four. So you, one BTU going in. But if you make, it, a lot has to do with how you grow these virgin oils. So what's the, one of the big problems with the agricultural process today in the United States? What's one of the huge issues that we're facing right now? And it goes back to like the natural gas thing. Big problems with agriculture as far as impacts on our planet kind of thing. Fertilizer, nitrogen cycle, exactly. We're taking nitrogen out of the atmosphere, turning it into fertilizer, and making it available for plants. And it, it affects this nitrogen cycle, which is one of the other great geochemical cycles. And it is also out of balance because of this. But we end up putting too much fertilizer out there. It ends up, where does it go? And what away? Watersheds, exactly. So we can cause enormous problems if we want to ramp up our agricultural system to feed us and to fuel us. So there's been this, what they call the food versus fuel issue. You know, you take more land to grow biofuel, then there's less land available for food, which drives the price of food up. But it also, you know, this incredible desire to have cheap energy could force us to even use more inputs, the idea of natural, of these uh, chemical inputs, and drive the cycle of imbalance even more. One of the other things of problems with agriculture. Rot rot rotating crops is one of the, a solution um, to some of the problems. Monoculture is one of the big problems with agriculture, where you grow, you know, if, you, if you've flown over the United States and you see the Midwest, you just see these giant patches of corn that go on endlessly, or soybeans. And they're using a very intensive form of agriculture to grow this volume of uh, material, which becomes the base material for our food industry and for some of the petrochemicals. So agriculture has enormous impacts. Water is another one. We use enormous amounts of water, aquifers. We're draining aquifers so fast. I mean, these are geologic features that have taken tens of thousands of years, maybe hundreds of thousands of years, to be sequestered into the ground, this wonderful water. And we're pulling it out and throwing it out onto these industrial agricultural fields to increase production. And we're trying to grow things in places where we really probably shouldn't be. So other problems with agriculture, industrial agriculture, soils, you know, this area. We lost all of our soil, all that nice little loamy you know, garden soil that usually sits on most areas during the glacial period, the last glacial period, a lot of Canada's topsoil got pushed down into America. And that's kind of why our Midwest has been this huge abundance of uh, ability to grow stuff. But we're losing that because of the type of agricultural policies that we're implementing, this open field irrigation where we cut the soil open with big tractors that are, fossil, that are moved by fossil fuels, exactly. So it all comes around. So we're seeing the intensity of our agricultural systems grow as has our fossil fuel consumption. It's great, we get more food, but it's got all these downsides. So this idea of balance of the planet 
the idea that the planet has this really amazing system. And what we're doing in the Midwest, the prairie ecosystems, the tall and the short grass ecosystems of the prairie, there's very little of it left. But it has supported enormous populations of buffalo and elk and deer. It was one of those great ecosystems of the planet. And when we went in there and absolutely decimated it. And there's only little chunks of those tall grass and, tall and short grass ecosystems left. And this guy who came up with this idea of the four um, great carbon epochs has this institute called the Land Institute. And he's trying to study these perennial systems of the short and tall grass and how we can say, maybe genetically manipulate through crossbreeding, but also through really smart planning to design those ecosystems and bring them back to produce the fruit, the seeds that we can both eat and use for biofuel. Very, very challenging from an energy standpoint. Those systems were pretty tuned in to a process, a cycle that wasn't as robust as our current economy. Our GDP, GMP, we consume enormous amounts of material. So to get us to be able to shift back to those types of ecosystems and use them as our source of fuel is going to be really challenging. So going forward, you know, we are currently um, interested in, you know, we're trying to, in our site over in East Durham, show some of what's possible. And unfortunately, because our vehicles get such low miles per gallon, the amount of biofuel that we can consume and produce and actually make a difference in our needs is, is pretty small. I mean, it's just, you know, we as a country produce about 10 gallons of waste veggie oil um, per person per year. So 10 gallons isn't going to get you very far. I mean, it might get you out for a night to the movies. And that's about it, you know. So trying to live on a budget of 10 gallons per year per person is going to be really, really hard. So the next step is to go to these virgin oils and as well animal fats. You know, we can render the, you know, we've got all of this animal industry out there, the hog industry, the chicken industry. And when they take these animals and you know, pull the meat off of them, there's some material left over and they render it. They put it in a big cooker and the oil floats to the top. And that oil is used for all sorts of stuff. Kind of nasty. But that oil can be used as, a, as an energy source. But that brings back the question of how much meat is being produced and should we really be eating meat because we really need that land mass. When we talk about budget, the amount of energy that goes into producing a pound of meat is an enormous amount, an amount of water, an amount of land. So when we look at this balance, you know, eating meat, if we were to say make the biggest impact on our, in our life um, on trying to save the planet, it would probably be reducing consumption of meat. Of course, then there's no animal fat to make biodiesel, so it's around and around you go. Um, it, there's just no easy out. It, there's all of these issues, and they're all connected. So, you know, right now for us in East Durham, we are collecting veggie oil from local restaurants. We put little bins out behind the restaurants and go suck it up with a, what we call a super sucker. We put a vacuum on a big propane tank. So the propane tank's about the size of this table. And we have hoses with valves on them and we have a little vacuum pump and we flip it on, plug it in. Of course, the energy coming from the electricity is probably coal fired or nuclear power. Not so good. Someday we'll be able to battery charge that vacuum pump. So we'll be really off the grid and really, really lower our footprint. So we put a vacuum on this pump, on this tank, and we go around in our truck and we stick the wand down into the, the 55 gallon drums that the guys from the restaurant have poured their oil in from the fryer and suck it out and bring it back to our site. And then we pump it into a tank and then we process it. And you use methanol, which is mostly fossil fuel produced by about 20%. And then you use potassium hydroxide, which is your catalyst to do the transesterification. That is also a chemical that's produced by the petrochemical industry. Um, a few years ago, the school here had its own biodiesel processor, and you guys were actually making your own fuel. It's pretty cool, but liability issues kept you guys from being able to keep that bioprocessor, and we actually ended up getting it. We handed that off to another school. Um, 
but it's pretty amazing chemistry, really, really simple. For 10 gallons of waste veggie oil, you end up getting about eight gallons of biodiesel and two gallons of glycerin left over. That glycerin usually has a fair amount of methanol in it, and you have to recover that if you really want to lower your footprint. The methanol is toxic. You don't want to breathe it. It'll make you go blind. It'll make you sick. Um, so you have to be very careful with it. It's also very, very flammable. You can distill it from the glycerin and be able to reuse it, but when you usually do that, there's water that gets caught into the methanol, and the water reduces the methanol's ability to react in the next reaction. You don't want any water in your reaction. It messes up the reaction. So when we bring the veggie oil back, we tend to heat it, separate the oil. Oil goes to the top, water goes to the bottom. We try to keep it as dry as possible, keep the moisture level out. Um, and then mix the methanol and the potassium hydroxide based on the, what they call the titration rate of the, um, of the veggie oil. This is veggie oil right here. It's a lot darker. This is the biodiesel. So what we do is we'll take a sample of the veggie oil. We'll do a titration to figure out what its fat, fatty acid level is, the amount of fat or the fat chains, the carbon uh, chains are in it. And then measure out the potassium hydroxide to the amount needed of methanol and uh, mix them together and then mix the veggie oil together with the biodiesel. And simply, you know, you can do biodiesel in the classroom pretty easily. You can take your veggie oil, mix some potassium, you know, measure out a couple of grams of potassium hydroxide, put it in one of those Pepsi liter, you know, one liter bottles, and just shake, and just shake it for about 20 minutes and sit it on a table and maybe 30 minutes later, out comes the biodiesel and the glycerin goes right to the bottom, and you'll see this dark layer of glycerin, which is used in all sorts of things, soap, making soap, and then the biodiesel sits on the top. What we do is we usually decant or take the glycerin off the bottom layer, pull that off, and it goes into another vat, and then the biodiesel that's left over, we clean, we filter, we um, wash it, we put some water through it, and it cleans out anything left over from the reaction. And that usually goes down the drain. It's got some stuff in it that's not so great, but it, at the front end of a sewer plant, a lot of those materials are actually good things because it helps the microbial community really take off and do well. So, you know, it's not so bad to put it into a sewer system, but you definitely don't want to put it into water you know, and let it out into the, the natural um, environment. It would break down if you did it in small amounts, but in larger amounts, it would cause eutrophication and problems. So the biodiesel that's left over, you wash, and then you put through a filtration process, usually a five micron filter, and then it's ready to go. You can plug it into any diesel engine, and that is an amazing thing. Any diesel engine can run biodiesel. You don't have to do any modifications. It's simply a plug-and-play fuel. Um, in the case of, there, I guess you all have heard of straight veggie oil kits, where people are putting systems on their diesel engines where they can run this straight in. You can do that. And diesel, Rudolf Diesel, who designed the diesel engine, designed his engine to run on peanut oil originally. You know, we decided to use diesel once diesel was just discovered. Diesel is an interesting fuel as a petroleum in that it doesn't require as much cracking as other petroleum products. Petroleum has, you know, it's the same concept distillation. You put that oil that comes out of the ground into a big that heated up and off comes through these different sieves or um, materials that they use, the different products that we use in society. It's real simple um, chemistry, real simple um, processing. So in the case of you know, a waste veggie oil or an SVO kit on a diesel engine, what you have to do is you preheat the oil to get it up to enough high enough temperature so the diesel engine compresses it and ignites. So they usually take a line from the radiator back to the oil or the fuel tank, and that engine heat helps keep that fuel, that um, waste veggie oil, hot as it enters in the uh, engine. If you don't do that, and if you don't achieve a certain level of temperature before that veggie oil gets into the engine, it will not combust completely and will ruin the engine eventually. It will carbonize it. You know, the, carbon will start collecting on the sides of the pistons and everything else. So anyway, 
Bed, biodiesel is an awesome fuel. It's really good, but we don't have enough of it. We don't have enough of the feedstock. The other biofuel that's out there is ethanol. You guys know about that, right? We get it in our petroleum, and it's made here in this country from what? Corn, exactly. Where do they, what do they make it from in Brazil? Exactly, yep. Highly efficient, really, really efficient. They are almost petroleum independent um, because of their sugar cane and ethanol. Um, all their cars that are being produced there are ethanol ready. It's just a little computer chip and a couple of other things. Ethanol tends to be pretty um, corrosive on different materials, so you have to put in pumps and things like that that are a little bit more hoss that can handle the corrosive effect. So all combustion engines can run ethanol with these minor modifications. But it, again, comes back to this idea of balance. What is your source material for the feedstock of your ethanol? If you're making it from sugarcane, the BTU ratios are pretty good. You're actually doing the planet a favor. If you're making it from corn, not so good. Probably a loss, primarily due to this industrial agricultural system that we are relying on. So going forward, you know, what are we going to do as a society to make this thing work? We've got biobutanol as a new um, material that is basically taking ethanol to the next level. It's one more process than taking ethanol. And it's actually a really cool fuel because it's not as hydrophilic. Ethanol, man, it, you will get the knocks. If it rains, um, we have an ethanol vehicle, and the moisture somehow gets in the system, and it makes the, the engine knock. Ethanol is very hydrophilic. It likes moisture. Biobutanol does not and has a little bit higher energy level, closer to petroleum equality. Ethanol is about a 20% reduction in your energy um, ratio. So when you go and see the price of ethanol or E85, it's cheaper than regular petroleum, but you're only getting 80% you know, of the, the value from an energy standpoint. So this balancing thing really is a constant equation. And for us, as a little producer of biodiesel over in East Durham, we have to constantly figure out, is it in our cost effectiveness to do this? And how do we find economies? How do we find a scale that makes this stuff work? And I can tell you, with vehicles that only get 20 miles per gallon, this is just a, it's a losing proposition. We need vehicles that get over 100 miles per gallon. And the technology is here today. So we could, you know, obviously biking is the way to go, and we need to design our communities to be able to bike to them. And in the case of a type of equipment that is available today, you know, we don't see it, but the technology is here, a plug-in hybrid diesel would make enormous sense. We don't see them. Why? It's bad news. Technology is here. We have the hybrid technology. We can do both mechanical hybrid systems and battery-based. Battery systems are improving, and they're going to get better. But the diesel engine lasts forever. It gets high miles per gallon. It's very efficient. And we can run biofuels. So for around town, we pull our car into the garage. We plug in overnight. We use the electrical battery system to get us for our local commute. But when we want to go visit grandma you know, in the next town over, we put biofuel in our vehicle and are able to run on it. Easily, we could get vehicles over 100 miles per gallon if we combined those three technologies. We just aren't seeing it. And it's really up to you guys to get out there and demand that this stuff is available to us to consume. And then simply, we've got to really change our lifestyles. You know, it, everything is connected. Right now, we are consuming too much of this stuff. And we're not leaving anything for future generations or other folks around the world. And we're messing up this system, this atmospheric system. We've got to really lower the throughput of, of how we consume dramatically. And it is very possible to live a very fulfilling and have a wonderful life without all of this energy. We use way too much energy. And if we do use it, we need to figure out ways to offset in our life that energy. We need to figure out carbon offsets and ways to mitigate. So that's kind of what I wanted to talk about. Anybody got any questions? Um, I've got, there's a couple of cool flyers. I can send these to you in PDF form. One is just to come and frequently ask questions about biodiesel. And that's, you can find that just about anywhere. The um, 
Triangle Council of Governments and the Solar Center are excellent resources. If you want really good information on making fuel and the whole concept of biofuels and agriculture, Central Carolina Community College has a really good program in sustainable biofuel, um, as well as um, green building. And then I've got this one. This sheet is um, diesel exhaust and school bus idling. Asthma is epidemic in our communities at this point, and it's primarily from mobile sources of pollution. And you know, children are riding on the school bus in the mornings and in the afternoons, and they're getting exposed to the emissions coming off the tailpipes of these buses. And, the, and these buses are poorly designed. The emissions go right inside the cab. The numbers, statistics uh, with regards to the emissions inside those cabs are horrible. And if people knew, they would be freaked out, but they they're suppressing that information. They don't want people to know how bad it is. And you know, it affects everybody, and it's a huge cost and burden on society. Do you know anybody with asthma? Anybody? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm starting to really feel it. In the last, say, 10 years or so here in the Triangle, the, the air quality is terrible. It's just gotten horrible. I'm really sensitive. I mean, I can smell a cigarette at 100 feet. It's just, I, I just designed that way or whatever. But getting school buses to use more biodiesel may be one of the most important public policy things that we all as a community can, can get involved in and get in, behind. It's easy to do. Even if they went to B20 or B50, there's no challenge from a technology standpoint. It's totally easy to do. We've been trying to get biodiesel over at the school buses at Duke. We had a grant from the Department of Energy. They refused because of all the challenges associated with biodiesel. Biodiesel is a pain. It's not easy. It has, it's a temperamental fuel. It's seasonal. In the cold weather, it gels up, so you have to blend in more diesel. There's nothing you can do about that. Um, it's just the, it's the nature of it. But around here, given how warm it's getting, we're probably not going to have to gel or blend too much. So this is a, a really important issue that you all can rally behind um, and do and, and you take on as student activists. And we each need to be more active and involved in these types of issues. It's not just about our career. It's not just about our studies. We really need to get out there in the community and figure out ways that we can plug in and hit what we call the choke points of change. And this is a cool area. So thanks for your time. Any questions? That all makes sense? Cool. All right. Thanks, y'all. Thanks.